Last year, I decided to talk about my non-PNSO favourites. I shared my 10 favourite Safari Limiteds and my 10 favourite Collectes. I'd originally planned to do this video before the end of 2022, but other things intervened. So I thought it would be nice to finish off what I started. So we'll look at my favourite from the line that started it all for me almost three decades ago, the Carnegie Collection. I've said before I tend to choose models based on three factors, sculpted detail, paint applications, and scientific accuracy. However, this will not hold for the Carnegies, mainly because they were products of an age gone by, one might almost say vintage. So, as we look at my top favourites, you won't see the sculpted detail we're pampered with today. The paint applications would be basic by today's standard, as to accuracy, well, Again, by today's standards, many would be downright ludicrous. But I value models that, when released, reflected the current beliefs of the time. And just because we've moved on doesn't mean I love them less. Indeed, for my Carnegie's, I love some precisely because of how quaint and outdated they look. Not only does it give me a smile, it also gives me a commentary of the evolution of ideas and knowledge. So, my favourites are sometimes chosen more for nostalgia, than any objective measure. Now, before I forget, however, uh, for those of you who also love vintage dinosaurs, I want to shout out a couple of resources. The first is Jurassic Plastic's YouTube channel, where he not only covers Carnegie models, but topics of interest such as tripods and degenerating paint apps. He's criminally undersubscribed, so go check him out. The other is what I feel is the premier site when it comes to learning about these marvellous figures. That's the Dinosaur Mountain Carnegie Collection Dinosaur Archive, where you'll find information on just about every Carnegie Collection model ever produced, including a bunch of variants I knew nothing about. I'll put the links in the description below. Alright, back to the regular program. Now these are my top 10 favourite Carnegie's, and you'll know if you've watched my Collecte and Safari favourites videos, I'll cheat a lot. So number 10 is the 1988 Tyrannosaurus Rex. Now here's as vintage of a T-Rex as I have. This upright stance is so typical of the depictions I saw in the books as a kid. For example, this first Ladybird book. So it's nice to have a representation of that was also my very first model of a T-Rex. Now what I really liked about Carnegie was that even in my early stages, I could tell they were somewhat elevated about the detail compared to the other normal toys. By today's eyes, you see how simple the detail is. Yet back in the day, it was considered an example to be followed. I especially liked the simple green coloration typical of dinosaurs at the time. Even the posture gives hints of a liveliness in a real animal that I've always felt was integral to my favourite models. Even in their early years, I already sensed something special about them, though I couldn't quite articulate what, and really was an attempt at accuracy according to the science of the day. And unlike today's models, I'm less critical and even rather enamoured of the distorted symmetry here. The teeth are just little lines almost. Um, the fingers are primitive and featureless. The feet are, well, as you can see, pretty basic. And quite shockingly, and of course it doesn't want to do that now, is that in some circumstances, it actually stands on two feet without the use of the tail as a tripod. Number 9 has to be my first serious sea reptiles ever. These two Carnegie Collection plesiosaurs. I believe I got this Chronosaurus first. Here you see the very tubular form. Now obviously, this is so grossly inaccurate by today's standards that listing it since would take up too much time. It was after all 1997, 
Still, it was a delight being unapologetically massive and a real badass just in sheer size. And you can see some effort has been made in the texture of the head and the body. Now at this point, Carnegie was still trying to respect the 1 to 40 of scale or thereabouts. It was quite sobering to realise how big this animal was. Or at least was thought to have been, compared to the T-Rex. Carnegie also gave us this Elasmosaurus, and to this day, it's the only Pisiosauroid I have. I like how there's a Loch Ness monster vibe to this thing. You can see it's really got a very vintage look, especially in that long curved neck. And you start to see some very nice fading in the paint tabs. Here in the neck. the mottling, as well as hearing the flippers. And the speckles on the side. And these two gave me my first representatives of each major plesiosaur brunch, and until the wild safari like Pluridon, and of course the PNSO offerings, I had no other sea monsters. In fact, this still is the only plesiosaur I have, unless PNSO gives us one, which I suspect won't be too far off. Number 8 is the 1988 Dimetrodon. Now, this pelicosaur is a popular must have in all children's books, and who could argue with the novelty of that sail back? You can see here the charm of the misshapen face and head, but also an example of what compromises are made to keep small animals in the same scale. There's an almost melted appearance to the visage. In fact, the hands and feet almost seem melted together here in a shapeless mess. And speaking of shapeless, the texture of the skin can hardly be described, but uh, to say it's ugly, real ugly. But it's cute that it captures that perpetually open mouth you see in most Dimetrodon art, like the walking pose. Uh, with the head turned to one side. The mouth is completely toothless, giving it a gummy appearance that's goofy but adorable. There's a very simple pattern, yet see how the colour actually goes quite nicely with the skin. Now coming in at number 7, I'll just say Ceratopsian Trio, the usual suspects. We have here the quintessential Ceratopsian, the 1988 Triceratops. And I love those stocky, bruiser-like proportions with the columnar elephantine legs. And 
And of course, those toes. Uh, you can obviously forget about the fourth or fifth clawless, non-weight bearing fingers in the hand that we see today. The pose promises potential violence or bursts of speed. Now, this is not some sluggish oaf, but a very active animal. The skin texture is again primitive by today's standards, but it stood out from the toys of its time. And you can see how nicely it stands off against the T-Rex. Next, we have the 2002 Styracosaurus, which is when I really learned to appreciate scale in a way I never did before. When all you have are isolated illustrations like this, It's hard to realize that similar types of dinosaurs like the Ceratopsians really came in all sizes, and also just how huge Triceratops was. Now this may look more dangerous with all these spikes, but actually it looks like this compared to the trike. Really no contest. Now the spikes do have the correct number and arranged such that you can definitely differentiate the P2, 3, and so on, uh, which I discussed in my PNSO Styracosaurus review. Again, this is another very dynamic pose with the promise of action. And speaking of size comparisons, the third of the must-have Ceratopsian trio, at least for me, is this Protoceratops. And you can really tell the size variability among Ceratopsians. One thing that Carnegie Collection really did for me was to give me a representation of all the dinosaurs I got to know from reading. What's more, this was the first diorama I ever had, depicting as it does a mother with her clutch of eggs. And also, this is when I first had an inkling that maybe the same scale for all means certain compromises when it comes to detail. And if you look at the, the rudeness of detail, and yet the attempt to actually create the scene with the baby, this clutch of eggs, it really captures a moment of life seldom seen in those days and even today in favour of more sensationalist poses. Then we have this 110 scale Therizinosaurid Beipiaosaurus. Now at this point, it's clear that Carnegie has really caught up with the modern look uh, in 2006, including a take on feathers. And whoa, what a beauty this is. First, just have a look at the detail on those feathers. Now, this is an example of what flexibility in scaling allows you to do, because if they kept this to 1 to 40th, there's no way they could have sculpted this. Or even if they could, there'd be no way to see the feathering. And then just look at how these fades are done. Are so smooth and naturalistic. It's as good as many mass-produced models today. In the neck, see how naturally this white streak blends with the rest. The very carefully painted golden eyes. Even the teeth are carefully picked out in this off-white. See some fading in the claws of the hands. of the feet, and in the tail. Really, this is one of those examples in a stark reminder that many current model makers really need to up their game. This gal came out in 2006, that's about 16 years ago.